they're, they're, they're people that would be unionized and stuff, and they're still going to go ahead and stay, despite they could go to a right-to-work state? Yeah, I, I don't think that those issues have, have much to do with the, the, the companies that I'm talking about. Uh, theirs have more to do with Ohio's tax rates just being incredibly high. Um, and, and I'm not sure where we are on the scale of the 50 states now, but uh, I remember back when Ken Blackwell was running for governor, I think uh, at least some measures had us, uh, the combined state and local taxes were third or fourth highest in the country. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I know that we were at least in the top seven for a long time. And, uh, and I think by the end of this year, we'll be in a very different spot. Uh, and I think right now we're in a very different spot than we were uh, only six or seven months ago. And I'm not sure which measure he was using, but, uh, but Speaker Batchelder and I talked about this yesterday. And, and there are some measures of, of the state's competitiveness uh, for attracting business. And, uh, and, and in the measure that he was looking at, we jumped 11 states in the last six months. Wow. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I'd have to see where we started at um, versus where we are now. I think wherever we are now, there's more work that could be done. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be happy until we're in the top five or 10. Uh, and I think in a lot of measures, we've been historically at the low end. Uh, but uh, but I think that that's a significant sign of improvement, and I think that we've jumped 11 states. I'd be curious to see where Illinois went, because I suspect that they've fallen about 10 or 11 or more. Um, uh, without getting too much into the, the, the issue that you're talking about, I will say that we had significant changes in uh, prevailing wage uh, in this budget. And uh, we actually sat down with the trade unions and worked out a compromise with them. And so that the, uh, the size of projects that are excluded from those rules, I think, is increased by three or four hundred percent now. Uh, and that was something where they understood that things needed to be done as well. And, uh, and I think a lot of people are interested in moving the state forward and, and didn't want another situation where we ended up with referendums and things like that. And we said, look, what's a, what's a reasonable compromise that's good for the state, that's good for business, that's good for workers? We can figure something out, and we did. Um, but uh, I guess uh, I will move back into the, the, the list of things that we've done. Uh, most of the people here, I'm sure, are familiar with Jobs Ohio. I think I've probably come and mentioned it four or five times in the last six months. But uh, we're going to be taking up the second half of that legislation this fall, so it's going to be a big initiative. Uh, but, but essentially what we've done is privatize substantial portions of the Department of Development uh, and, uh, and put the, the duty of job creation for the state in the hands of people who really know how to create jobs, people from the private sector who've been successful in the private sector, who understand how things work. Uh, so we're going to have, I guess for lack of a, of a better term, a, a nonprofit venture capital fund for the state of Ohio that focuses on job creation in the state of Ohio. And, and a few other states have tried things like this. And uh, I think Bloomberg and, and some other uh, financial industry uh, publications have talked about ours and, and noted that uh, the, the revenue stream for ours will be several times larger than anyone that's been tried anywhere else. Uh, so not only are we moving in the right direction, but we're moving in the right direction uh, in bigger and better ways than other states are. And Mark Kwame, the person who will be heading that up, uh, is very successful in the private sector. and. Uh, uh, is, is a partner in, in the, the investment company that owns about 14 percent of the NASDAQ and, uh, and could be making a lot more money doing something else frankly uh, but but decided that he would come help our state because he made a personal promise to himself a number of years ago that he would help a million people before he died and uh, I, I think eventually you, you realize how big that number is and wonder how you're going to accomplish that goal uh, and you've got you've to find a way where you can knock out 500,000 uh, and, and coming back here and helping us restore the jobs we've lost in the, in the last 10 years is, is the way that he's decided he's going to try to do that. So he works for us for about a dollar a year um, and, uh, and travels back and forth between California on his own dime, I believe, and, uh, and, uh, and is actually now moving to the state because he was originally going to be here for a few months while we got Jobs Ohio up and running, and the more he got involved in it, the more he decided this is where I want to be. I want to stay here and help people as long as I can, as long as John Kasich's governor. 
so, uh, so we've got somebody from the private sector who really understands uh, where to target investments and, and, and how to keep jobs and how to create new ones. Uh, and we're going to have a board for Jobs Ohio that is made up of people like that, uh, people who've been successful in the private sector. Uh, people who really understand the issues and, and who are in this for the right reason. Nobody's going to be rich working for Jobs Ohio. Uh, and they're all people who could make more money somewhere else but are here because they want to help the state and they want to help the people who've lost their jobs in the last 10 years. Uh, so, so we've done that. We've done uh, 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 regulatory reform. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, previously here we're also going to be auditing state agencies to uh, make them more efficient and streamlined and and that we got this idea from looking at other states. Washington State in particular is one that has done something like this and saved billions of dollars. And uh, our government and our economy are both larger than Washington, uh, as our state is. And, and uh, if they could save significant amounts of money doing something like this, we anticipate pretty good results here, too. And uh, Dave Yost, uh, to his credit, uh, his state auditor, uh, took out bids to audit his agency first to audit his own office because he said, you know, leadership starts at home uh, and we're going to lead by example. Uh, so, so we're moving in the right direction there. Uh, and, and if we look at the budget, I think what we did in this year's budget is pretty astounding. I mentioned some of the uh, improvements we made uh, in prevailing wage and some other areas, but we had a major construction reform. Uh, we restored uh, the last year of the uh, phase-in for the income tax cut. Uh, we eliminated the estate tax which is something that is very important, not just to businesses, but to a lot of people in particular in the 22nd District, because uh, frankly, it breaks up family farms. Uh, and, and we actually had a township trustee from this district come testify in favor of eliminating the estate tax, even though it would cut money to the township, because a half dozen people she knew had their farms ripped apart. So this is this is good for this is good for farmers. It's it's good for small businesses. It's good for the state. And in the long run, it will lead to, I believe, more money coming into the state coffers. In the short term, obviously, it won't. But in the, in the long term, I I think that this is something that's important to small business. And we have a lot of people who are leaving the state, not necessarily just because of the estate tax, but it's certainly a factor that you consider. And, and we have so many people, actually, who, who have left the state uh, because of the estate tax that I believe the House Caucus had a fundraiser in Florida uh, that uh, was made up exclusively of people from Ohio who now live in Florida uh, because they didn't want to have to deal with Ohio's burdensome tax system. And that's a problem. Uh, it's not just a problem because if those people move, you're not getting their estate taxes. Uh, uh, the real problem is they go down there for 180 days a year, 181 so that they're not subject to the tax, and then they realize the weather's great, and they start spending more time there, and then it's 190 days a year, and then it's 200 and 250, and eventually they're not here at all. And a lot of these people are still working, and so they're paying income taxes or sales taxes, or they're going out and buying cars, or going to restaurants, or going to the grocery store. Uh, in another state instead of here. We're, we're basically scaring people away. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we got rid of the death tax. Uh, it's, it's something that should have never been in existence in the first place. Uh, it, it is. Only 17 states had one to begin with. So we're already an outlier just by virtue of having the tax. But Ohio's income level at which that kicked in was lower than the second lowest in the entire country by a factor of two to one. So we really were the outlier. We were, we were far worse than even other states that had the tax already. And you can't be competitive uh, if, you're, if you're taxing people that much and you're, and you're scaring small businesses away and you're breaking up farms and, and you're encouraging people essentially to move to Florida. But aside from the competitiveness issue, it's not right. It's not something the state should be doing. That money's been taxed already several times. And the fact that you want to spend the money or that you may have needs for spending the money um, doesn't make it okay. And, and I think this is something on the constitutional front, this isn't a constitutional question, but something I always ask myself is, uh, before you ask yourself whether a statute is necessary or whether the outcome is desirable, you have to ask yourself whether it's constitutional. And I think that with the estate tax, uh, uh, you need to ask yourself, 
is it, is it the moral thing to do? Is it the right thing to do? Because if the answer is no, then you don't worry about all those other questions. Those other questions come after you decide that it's okay, not before. You don't say, how much money do I need? I'm going to get it. Now what can I do to get it? You say, what are the reasonable, proper ways to fund things? So I, I think that's something where we had it backwards uh, for a really long time, and, and, and we finally uh, come around and, and, and again start moving in the right direction. Um, and, and I think that uh, if you look at the budget, uh, the thing that really sticks out to me about it is that uh, the governor uh, and his team, and, and then Ron Amstutz in particular in the House, and Chris Widener in the Senate were able to find ways to close a $7.7 .7 billion gap uh, without just going through slashing things. Uh, there are a lot of cuts in there, I'm not going to lie about that, and, and, and I'm sure not everybody's happy about that, and there are parts of the budget that I'm not a fan of. Uh, it's 4,900 pages, I believe. There, there are going to be things that everyone doesn't like in there, and things that you know, some things that everybody does like. But, uh, but at the end of the day, we had a job to do, and like I said earlier, quoting the Wall Street Journal, 56% uh, increase in income, not going to happen. Massive tax increases that the state can't afford. Uh, what are our other choices? And, and, and John Kasich uh, really. Uh, with his team spent a lot of time trying to find creative ways to uh, limit spending uh, without cutting services. And some of the ways that he, he did it uh, are by spending more money up front this year so that we have to spend less next year. And, uh, and one of the examples that I've heard him give a number of times and, and, and one that, that is, is, is uh, particular importance to me, I guess, because I've had a, a few children born a little earlier than we would have liked, um, is uh, they discovered that on average, uh, premature birth costs about $78,000 for the state uh, because uh, you have stays in the NICU, you have additional medical costs over the life of the child, a lot of things that add up to a lot of money. Uh, and, and, uh, and the governor's team said, well, if we spend about 2000 or 3000 extra dollars up front for women on Medicaid to give them additional prenatal care, uh, some large number uh, of percentage that we can calculate of those children won't be born prematurely and we'll save $78,000 at the, at the back end. So why not do this? Why not spend $3,000 now so that we don't have to spend $75,000 $78,000 later? Uh, and you see a lot of things like that in this budget uh, where we're actually uh, doing things that are better for the people of the state. Uh, and we're still helping people and we're providing services that, that, uh, that some people need, uh, but we're doing so in a much more effective, much more efficient way uh, that costs the state a lot less money in the long run. Uh, and I think a lot of states face similar problems that we do, and, and I venture to, to guess that some of them just slash their budgets across the board by 18%. And if you have to do that, then you have to do that. But, uh, but we took, a, I think, a better approach, a, a more complex approach, uh, but one that in the end is, is, is better for the budget, better for the long-term growth of the state, better for the people that we're serving. Uh, and, and, and I think the last thing I'd like to point out in the budget, uh, in addition to the income tax cut, uh, the fact that we balanced it creatively and, and the fact that we got rid of the estate tax is, is uh, something uh, relatively new that, that I, I'm not sure how many people have heard about this or not, but we have something called Invest Ohio uh, that, that we put in there, which is uh, to create uh, long-term uh, growth in the state. Uh, we are going to give 10% uh, 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 up to 10% uh, tax credits for people who are investing in small businesses in the state. Uh, and, and there is requirements attached to this that if you do, uh, you have to keep the investment here for a certain number of years. Uh, and uh, you have to tell us up front, I think, how many, how many jobs you're going to be creating with this, uh, uh, what the long-term prospects for growth are in, in your company, uh, so that the state can help people who want to do business here, so that we can attract more capital for small businesses. And, and that's something that, uh, that I think is going to be a big deal, perhaps as, as important as Jobs Ohio, uh, in terms of uh, getting the state back up and running again. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions, I guess. Uh, if, if anybody has anything else that, that you want to talk about, I'm, I'm happy to stay here until everyone is just bored out of their minds from listening to me. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Larry, uh, 
Congratulations on the job creation and the constraint. And how are we going to prevent our esteemed president from taking credit for it? Uh, he's already tried, actually, uh, and Ted Strickland has tried as well. Uh, the Columbus Dispatch, about a month or two ago, did a story where they said we'd had 62,000 new jobs in the last four months, and within about a day, I think, uh, Governor Strickland uh, issued a press release congratulating President Obama on the auto bailout. Uh, but like I said, the, these jobs, the growth that we've seen in Ohio, they haven't been because GM had 10,000 new jobs because of the bailout. Uh, they were small businesses throughout the state where people are taking greater risks, uh, taking out loans that they weren't willing to do two years ago because they were too nervous uh, about the market, uh, people employing uh, an extra employee or two where a year or two ago they were too nervous about the market to do that. So I think we have the right type of growth. Uh, if other people want to take credit for it, you know, that's up to them. Uh, I'm, I'm not really worried about who who takes credit for things and who doesn't, and, and uh, I'm, I'm more worried about getting another 65,000 people uh, working. And, and if we do that, if everyone else uh, uh, fires out press releases and at the end of the day people think that uh, President Obama or Ted Strickland is a hero, uh, I don't really care about that. Uh, I, I want 65 more thousand jobs. I, I want 550,000 because that's what we lost in the last 10 years, and, and that's what we need to replace to get everyone in Ohio working again. So. I think if you call my office on Tuesday, we can put you in touch with the Department of Development. Uh, we've got some great people working there. Uh, I've got one in particular who uh, uh, named uh, Daryl Revolt, who uh, grew up in uh, Wayne County. Uh, so uh, anytime there's anything around the 22nd District, I give him a call. Uh, but, uh, but we'll look into it and, and, and see what we can do. Um, I can give you my, my contact information after this. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if, if there's anyone who wants to reach me, I'll, I'll just give it to everybody now. Uh, my office number is 614-466-7505. Jeannie has a question. Okay. I'll get you next. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeannie. Well, Nancy asked me this question. And I didn't have an answer, but <clears throat> we heard, we heard um, that, that John Rustad, is that how you say it? Had, um, they'd taken the, the um, picture ID away from being necessary for voting. We wondered if you could explain the rationale for for. That's uh, that's actually uh, it's it's sort of a funny issue. Um, there's a separate bill dealing with that. Uh, that's House Bill 159, uh, and uh, John Husted had a pretty substantial package of elections reform issues uh, that uh, that he had proposed. And at the very last minute, I think before the Senate voted on it, there was some talk about adding that uh, the photo ID into the election bill. Uh, and uh, instead, the election bill passed on its own, and the photo ID will be considered separately. Um, that issue is is uh, uh, one that I, I think a lot of people probably don't know what the current law is. Uh, but uh, but under current law, you are required to show a photo ID or a current bank statement or a current utility bill. Uh, so I'm not sure that the that the new statute really adds much. Just my personal opinion, uh, because I don't think there's a, a, a rash of people out there committing fraud who are doing so with fake utility bills. Uh, I think there are places in the state where the current law probably ought to be enforced uh, more than it is now. Uh, but I'm not sure that adding another layer of, of difficulty changes that situation. Uh, places that enforce it, enforce it. Places that don't, don't. And and it's it's sort of like how I feel about a lot of gun control issues when, when people come out with them uh, uh, and try to try to tack on new regulations. If if the specific bad behavior you're worried about, the person was already breaking four laws. Does adding a fifth law really change that? Um, you know, when when what we really need is enforcement of the law that we have now. I was just going to ask, what are the major points of the election law? That uh, a, a lot of them have to do with uh, uh, 
I think we could refer to them as maybe accidental loopholes on prior laws. I think we had something that uh, was, was a derogatorily referred to as uh, Golden Week, um, where people, there was, there was a, a, a week before you were allowed to uh, uh, vote where, where people could register and vote on the same day. And I don't think that that was intentional. I think one law passed that said you know, 35 days or 37 days, and then another one said 30, and there was this gap in between. So, so that was part of it. Part of it is uh, uh, when um, absentee ballots can be sent and when they can be received, uh, when the polls can be open for early voting. Uh, I don't know how many people do that. I actually do uh, because I'm always busy on election day, either helping candidates or um, feeling calls at the ORP or, 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 or something else. So uh, I, I've traditionally gone the Saturday before, and this, you know, tells you which Saturdays you can do that and, and which days you can't. And, and a lot of it is, is targeted toward helping uh, local boards of elections, um, you know, deal with things in a more orderly fashion. Uh, you know, I, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. Uh, we did change the primary from next year, from March to May. Um, Is that only going to be this time because of the uh, districting? Yeah, that was just this time because this there time was a certain time. number of dates we would need, or, or a certain number of days in law that we would need after uh, the, the, the new districts for everyone, even at the local level, were drawn uh, to give local boards of elections time to get up and running and, and have everything printed off. And, this is like 2008. We, Ohio is totally irrelevant in the primaries, mm -hmm. you know, presidential primaries. It's kind of annoying. Not this time. Well, be, being uh, in May when everybody else is in March, I think will we'll probably diminish Ohio's uh, influence in the primary. Uh, but if it's a close primary, it might make us the deciding vote. So it, it really depends on things that we can't predict right now. Uh, but, but our real concern there was uh, really just once the districts are drawn, once, once everything else is in place, how do you give local boards of elections enough time to, to take care of everything they need yeah. to take care of? Yeah. I actually favor the earlier primary date, uh, but um, you know, at the end of the day, either we were going to have the districting done uh, in time or, or we weren't. And, uh, and because we had so many other big issues this year, uh, and we've had so much uh, so much work on our plate. I think redistricting in a normal year probably would have taken the entire spring and would be done, uh, and it would have been the, the central focus of what the legislature was doing. But this year we had the most difficult budget gap we've ever had. Uh, we had obviously SB five. We had all the other bills that I've mentioned, um, and whatever eighty one they passed in the House. So pretty pretty staggering number. So I think things have just been pushed back a little bit, but. Uh, is that uh, change of the uh, uh, primary date a done deal, or is it still? That's that's done. Okay. Now it, it's possible at some point if redistricting is much quicker than we expect that maybe we'll come back with a new number and have to change the law. But but that's in statute now. That was in uh, I believe it was House Bill 194 was the was the bill that we passed uh, with the election reforms, and it was in there. And the governor is uh, I believe signed that already. If he hasn't, he'll sign it the next week. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Got a couple more here. Uh, I, oh, we had somebody up here who wanted to ask a question too, so if he's still around outside, we should grab him. Well, go ahead. Um, I wanted to return back to the uh, to the photo ID photo ID issue because my understanding is that we'll be coming back to it. Might there's a, a chance we'll come back to a vote. Mm -hmm. In, in the Senate. Um, I'm taking a different tack on this. Um, I think that one of the things that I'm proud of, of being an American for is the fact that we don't have a national ID card. Mm -hmm. And my problem with the photo ID to vote bill is that I think that that is basically taking us down the road of a photo ID, of a national photo ID card. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of angry that, uh, that we're going down that path. And I want to know how, uh, and I'm going to actually add this. I happen to be a, a citizen of a second country that has a national ID card that is uh, that is actually issued that is actually issued out by the electoral authority. Um, I uh, I don't want to go down that direction. I want to know uh, 
I, I feel that, that that people are going that you cannot make an, a, a mandatory ID to vote and not be essentially creating a national ID. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I think there's some legitimate concern there. Um, and, and just so everyone in the room knows, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to hide anything. Uh, if uh, we were to vote on it today in the form that it is now, I would vote no on that. Uh, and uh, I suspect that a lot of people here probably uh, uh, would vote the other way. Uh, but, uh, but if you ask a, a, a straight question, you get a straight answer from me, and, and that's how I feel. I, I, think that, uh, I think that to the extent that there are uh, problems out there, like I said, those, those are problems that could be dealt with by enforcing the law that we have now. Uh, and, uh, and by making people show uh, your utility bill, if you have one, uh, then they do enforce that rule here in Medina. Uh, I've actually had to drive back uh, from uh, Rustic Hills uh, Country Club, I think is where my, my polling place is, and gone, gone back to my house and get something because I don't always carry my ID with me. Um, so I, I think the law now is, is sufficient. Uh, I think the law as it was passed by the House, I actually had some concerns about its legality because it didn't include uh, religious exemptions that we've added in the Senate uh, because we have a lot of Amish voters in Wayne and Holmes and, and Ashland County uh, and uh, most of them I, I think will probably